Welcome to the New York Public Library. Tonight, we present another in our series of virtual conversations from the Coleman Center, a presentation in collaboration with Live from NYPL. Past Coleman Center fellow Edward Ball will discuss his new book, Life of a Klansman, A Family History in White Supremacy. He is joined in conversation by the acclaimed scholar, Saidia Hartman. Both Ball and Hartman are past fellows of the Coleman Center. My name is Salvatore Scabona. I'm Sue Ann and John Weinberg, director of the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library. As some of you know, the Coleman Center selects 15 fellows a year for a nine month term. Fellows receive an office in the Coleman Center, intensive access to our collections and a living stipend so they can focus exclusively on their work during their fellowships. The fellows are some of the best and most promising academics independent scholars, poets, playwrights, journalists, dramatists, artists, and fiction writers at work today. They come to the library from around the country and the world to use the unparalleled collections housed here to write the books of tomorrow. The program was founded in 1999. To date, it has supported the work of more than 300 fellows. We are now accepting applications for the 2021-2022 year Anyone interested in applying is welcome to visit the Coleman Center's website and submit an application by September 25th. The next event in this series will be Monday, September 21st, when we present a conversation between scholar Nicole Fleetwood and Yale professor Elizabeth Hinton about Fleetwood's new book, Marking Time, Art in the Age of Mass Incarceration, which is about how the imprisoned turned ordinary objects into elaborate works of art. The book is based in part on interviews with currently and formerly incarcerated artists, prison visits, and the author's own family experiences with the penal system. Edward's Ball, Edward Ball's uh, books include The Inventor and the Tycoon, about the birth of moving pictures in California, and Slaves in the Family, an account of his family's history as slaveholders in South Carolina, which received the National Book Award for Nonfiction. He is also the recipient of a Public Scholar Award from the National Endowment for the Humanities. He worked on Life of a Klansman during his tenure as a Coleman Center Fellow in 2015-2016. Saidia Hartman is the author of Lose Your Mother, A Journey Along the Slave Route and Scenes of Subjection, Terror, Slavery, and Self-Making in 19th Century America. She is a professor of English and comparative literature at Columbia University and has been a Fulbright Scholar in Ghana, a Whitney Oates Fellow at Princeton University, a Rockefeller Fellow at Brown University, and a Critical Inquiry Visiting Professor at the University of Chicago. She was named a MacArthur Foundation Genius Fellow last year. She worked on her book, Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments, which won the National Book Critics Circle Award for Criticism in 2019 during her Coleman Center Fellowship in 2016-2017. If you haven't already, you can purchase Life of a Klansman through the library's shop. Just go to http colon slash slash on dot nypl dot org slash shop live. You can also find the link on YouTube and we've just dropped it in the Zoom chat as well. Before I invite Edward and Saidia on, there are a few uh, quick housekeeping items I should go over. This event is being recorded, not you, only the event itself, that is to say myself, Edward and Saidia are being recorded. Edward will take some of your questions at the end. You can send them at any time during the conversation by typing your question into the Q&A at the bottom of the Zoom app We'll try to get Edward to answer as many as he can. Now, please help me welcome Saidia Hartman and Edward Ball. And we are on. Yeah. Very good. Well, it's good to be with you. Thank you for doing this. Yes, no, it's great to be back home in the virtual NYPL in the virtual Coleman. And That's so right. we, um, we thought we would actually begin our discussion by having Ed read a bit from The Life of a Klansman, and then you all contextualize it a bit, and then we'll just start our discussion. That sounds good. The Life of a Klansman tells the story of a foot soldier in the Ku Klux Klan during Reconstruction, the years after the Civil War. 
a great great grandfather of mine named Constant Le Corn, who was a Creole French speaking uh, carpenter. And he uh, appears to have begun his most active um, phase of clan activity with a group in New Orleans called the Knights of the White Camellia, which was uh, a corollary to the Ku Klux Klan led by a guy called Alcibiade de Blanc. And I have a, a scene which depicts the night that he joined this group in New Orleans in a, in a mass meeting um, in uptown New Orleans. And here is a description of what took place. Uh, there is a series of induction rituals to join this group as there was for clan activity uh, throughout the Deep South. Candidate, this is the candidate, candidate Le Corn um, asking for membership. Candidate says, I am here, the commander of the outfit. Will you under all circumstances defend and protect persons of the white race in their lives, rights, and property against all encroachments or invasions by any inferior race, especially the African? Candidate, yes. There's no room for deviation from the script, no place where a person questions or shows doubt. It is a road to obedience. The candidate consents and raises his right hand in the oath. I swear to maintain and defend the social and political superiority of the white race on this continent, always and in all places, to observe a marked distinction between the white and African races and to protect and defend persons of the white race in their lives, rights, and property against the encroachments and aggressions of an inferior race. When the meeting ends at Oddfellows Hall, the gang of recruits walks out and fans into the night. The random killings spread. According to a report of the Freedmen's Bureau in early June, after the White Camellia meeting, a colored man, name unknown, is killed on the road by a Frenchman, cause unknown. Also in June, a white man named Francois Salison kills a colored man, name unknown. Outside New Orleans, a number of freed people are whipped and burned, and two women are ravished by four white men. Gangs that use the name Ku Klux Klan, having briefly appeared in March, seem to disappear from the southern half of Louisiana and retreat to the northern part of the state where they flourish. The Ku Klux Klan recruits thousands in the parishes of Caddo and Huachita. The White Camellia launches guerrilla cells in the parishes of Rapide and St. Landry, Terrebonne and La Fourche, St. Tammany and St. Bernard. Many in the White Camellia are Creole and they are merciless. By September, the White Camellia claims a membership of 15,000 men in New Orleans and the near parishes, Jefferson, Chalmette, St. Bernard. To exaggerate their number is part of the method of the Ku Klux and still the number of guerrillas is huge and they are busy. The White Camellia raids black villages and houses. Guerrillas torment women by humiliating them in front of their partners sometimes whipping them, sometimes raping them. The stories are raw, yet they are our stories. Not only are they our family stories and as vile as any can be, they are white tribal stories. I um, began this book about six years ago at the New York Public Library. And I started initially to write a novel about this man, Constant Le Corn, my great great grandfather, because I thought there was not enough of a paper trail to write a piece of history. And after writing three or four chapters, I decided 
that they were inadequate to the task and I decided to write history instead. And by that time, the events of Trayvon Martin and Alton Sterling and Tamir Rice and a hundred other, Eric Garner, a hundred other people whose names we now know had transpired. And it felt as though the story of a 19th century Klansman was coming more and more into synchrony with the events of public life in this country. And I was uh, mystified and enraged as much as anybody by this, especially I found it enigmatic in the extreme. Uh, in the end, I wrote a story that is set in the 19th century, but which tells uh, a life that bears a harmonic resemblance to the lives of um, Americans today, when white supremacy has surfaced in a series of geysers around the country once again. So that's where I would like to start it. This idea? Yeah, I guess, yeah. My first question was actually going to be about the time of its writing because, you know, over the course of its writing, you and I would have conversations. And I guess I wanted to hear you um, talk about what it meant to write this book under the Obama presidency versus under the Trump presidency uh -huh. and to have it come into the world this, you know, summer, our summer of, as you say, white yeah. supremacist resurgence, COVID pandemic, uh, brutal economic inequality, but also with, you know, um, the, a spring and summer of resistance, of protest, of rebellion. So, were there times where it seemed more or less relevant, more timely or less? Yeah. <clears throat> when I started writing this book, it was during the last two years of the Obama administration. And friends of mine said, well, why do you want to write about this subject? I mean, it seems so anachronistic. Um, and then, of course, 2016 happened, and it was as though the world was turned again upside down. Um, the massacre in Charleston, South Carolina, in June 2015 at the Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church was a pivot point for me writing this book. It was a pivot point, I think, uh, nationally, and it seemed to open a gate through which um, white, um, white supremacist uh, ideology and violence flowed into the public sphere. And I, I estimate that, you know, in the past five years, some 300 people have died in mass shootings connected directly to supremacist activities in many of those shootings accompanied by a manifesto of one kind or another written by the, the killer. And yet, and yet, this, this book is published now uh, during the summer of discontent and it seems to fall in step with a period of guarded optimism, I think, that I, I certainly feel. I mean, it appears from the media evidence that several million, if not tens of million, of white Americans and non-Americans are experiencing a kind of race consciousness shift 
at the same time this summer. It appears that way. And it appears that large numbers of white folks are able to see themselves as a racial group, perhaps many of them for the first time. And I find those painful steps um, hopeful and um, um, they are full of uh, portent for the future. At the same time, again, uh, I, we, we know that as uh, there is a progress narrative in which one sees, you know, the diminishment of, of uh, white uh, domination of social life. Um, 50 years ago during the civil rights movement, the progress narrative gained the great fuel of legislation in the, in the Civil Rights Act and the Housing Rights Act and, and in um, affirmative action plans that unfolded in the 1970s. At the same time that there is a progress narrative, white supremacy also becomes more sophisticated and takes new forms uh, and we see that also. Um, the, uh, well, I'll leave it there. Yeah, and I, I wanted to um, ask you, so you decided not to write the novel, but um, why this mode of family history and intimate history rather than a more straightforward non, you know, fiction book about the history of the clan? I mean, I think that the power and difficulty of the book is absolutely connected to um, to its intimacy, not only it being, quote unquote, your family story, and of course, you know, um, white supremacy as our national bedrock, um, but also intimacy in terms of its mode of narration. So what were you hoping to achieve um, by kind of like framing this history of white supremacy as a family story. I mean, one of the things that's unsettling as one reads the book um, are terms like my Klansmen, our Klansmen, and certainly for the white reader, they're solicited and implicated um, in particular ways as they read. Yeah, right. Well, I write um, family history, which is kind of a stepchild in historical scholarship. Family history is, is um, regarded with condescension by professional historians. I write family history as a way of gaining access to history with a capital H because the personal relationship to characters in the story enables identification. It enables um, access for readers and for those who hear um, stories of this kind recounted. It, it, it's, it sutures people to the emotional um, fabric of of, of the story. And I do that uh, intentionally because I do want to, in, in the final stage, help people to see American history and its, its uh, difficult parts as stamping their footprint onto the personal lives of all of us right down to the present. Um, and I do put myself in this book using the first person I quite a lot, uh, responding to events uh, often. Um, I do think that uh, writing this way uh, gives larger numbers of people um, access to the political and 
ideological flows of, of the times that we're trying to represent and helps people to see their relationship to the lives of the living, such as us. I was gonna ask you about, um, you know, was it a difficult book to write? Um, when you speak of this, you know, of the intimacy with your subject, and certainly as I was reading it, it was a, it was a difficult book to read. Um, and uh, because part of the work of speculation and creation, um, you know, that's unfolding in life of a Klansman is actually having to recreate the world, the thoughts, yeah. the feelings, the desires of Constant Lacorn. And, um, and that's, you know, this racist vision of the world. So often one is inhabiting the world and seeing it through, through that lens. What was it like to, to do that? I know that there were, um, again, moments where it was so difficult to read precisely because we um, are feeling not only, you know, it's not that he is quote unquote, um, a terrible person as an individual, but he is a representative person. So there's this one average man who's a carpenter who has a worldview. And then we see the way in which, you know, the great thinkers and philosophers are providing the architecture of that racist worldview. But what does it mean to inhabit that as a character and to produce a world from, from inside his skin? Well, it's uncomfortable, the more so because spending so much time inside the mind of a white working man of, you know, 1870, Louisiana, I began to see the world through his eyes. Um, the, uh, the reflexive reaction of, of many um, folks to a story like this is, oh, well, we don't have anybody like this in my family tree, you know, or I, you know, I, I wouldn't have not have been uh, a militant uh, supremacist had I lived at this time. And yet uh, the world in which uh, white, um, white society was in full and violent command of its surroundings began to make sense in the most perverse way. You, you mentioned the philosophers, the great philosophers, and um, I recount how early American science, the very first um, texts of American science emerge uh, as a way of uh, chronicling the races and their differences one from the other in in the sort of um, the nascent study of geology and the nascent study of 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 bones and and uh, the the terrible resentments and bitterness that the white south it felt when their premiership was ripped out of their hands by the end of the Civil War and the emancipation of four million black people becomes a kind of understandable fuel um, for the rage of marauding violence that ensues during Reconstruction. I was exhausted and, and, and um, physically um, made frail <laughs> sometimes by inhabiting this this world and uh, and yet i I wonder if there is not some sort of useful use value to um, 
extracting the the uh, the component parts of of white supremacy, which is which persists, but which is unrecognizable in many ways uh, when compared um, with its most violent late 19th century form. There is some utility to uh, telling the story of how it looked and functions. Utility for us today, I think, I think, I hope, I hope. I mean, I think that one of the, you know, things that the book achieves is, um, is really by saying white supremacy isn't an aberration. I mean, you yeah. describe it as, you know, yeah. a current or a river that um, feeds our national life, that it's fundamentally um, entwined with, you know, like the foundation of the Republic. And in doing that, um, it forces the reader to just to think about how normalized and constitutive white supremacy is rather than thinking of it as an aberration. And I was wondering if you would read um, three paragraphs on page 206 to 207, where um, again, you are, you're writing about Constant, but you're letting us know that his history is our present. So I don't know if you have those pages before you. I do indeed. Yeah. And, but yeah. If you could just, um, uh, yeah, those paragraphs, Constant Lacorn is one of the people. And just on the next, those like four paragraphs, I, I feel like so much of the critical labor of the book and its achievement um, is articulated there. So I don't know mm -hmm. if you remember that was sure. There. Yeah. Right. Well, this is, the book is full of storytelling and then there are moments of reflection and assessment and here's one. Constant Le Corne is one of my people. He is one of my family. How can I respond to the discovery of what he seemingly did in several ways? I do not feel responsible for the crimes he seems to commit. I mean, legally responsible for the reason that the living cannot control the acts of the dead. In the frame of the law, I do not feel culpable for the Mechanics Institute massacre. However, as a matter of conscience, I feel implicated. I feel associated with this cruel and merciless festival of violence. I feel a part of it because he acts on behalf of his family, our family, if you like. I have a feeling of wretchedness and shame. The family I share with Constant is remote. He is a great-great-grandfather of mine. Everyone has 16 great-great-grandparents, and Constant, to me, is one of those 16. Oral tradition, customs, and stories are the drivers of family history. I have a few stories from Constant's granddaughter, my aunt Maud Lacorn. A few smooth stories are not the same as membership in a continuous family life. But disavowal like this is a stage of grief. To disavow is to know something is true and terrible and yet to desire that it not be true and act as though it is false. To disavow is to push away a horror. Constant is one of 16 great-great-grandparents. The thought has a distancing effect. The reality is that Constant, my grandmother's grandfather, is a murderous actor on behalf of his family, on behalf of us and it is a vile taste in the mouth. I must own it in some way. He was a fighter for our gain, for our benefit. To say anything else is to prevaricate. It is not a distortion to say that Constant's rampage 150 years ago helps in some impossible to measure way to clear space for the authority and comfort of whites living now, not just for me, and for his 50 or 60 descendants, but for whites in general. I feel shame about it. That is not a distortion either. I am an heir to Constant's acts of terror. I do not deny it. And the bitter truth makes me sick at the stomach. Whites are my people, my tribe. They were Constant's people, his tribe. In that way, he belongs to us and to hundreds of millions. 
I know the honest way to regard race violence is this. American history is full of it. It is pandemic. The United States was founded upon racial violence. It is within the core of our national identity. Here is a way not to see these events. The marauders like Constant are immoral, abject, and bad people. They are not like us. They belong to someone else. It is truer to say this, the marauders are our people and they fight for us. Great. So. So is it true, this idea? Is that true? The marauders are our people and they fight for us? You see, I, I can't speak for all white people as, as black people are often um, inclined to say about blackness. Um, I, I mean, for, for, for me, the, the, the power of that is to say that it is white legacy and, and partly um, it positions then um, the reader and the white reader, because obviously um, Constant is not, you know, in the fight for me, his fight is against me. And that's why one feels the charge of his language and, you know, his views as you um, are reading. So it seems that, um, that that's to, I don't know, is it to have a certain set of expectations of what might happen for the reader what is yeah. so? What do you want to happen for the white reader of this book? Um, <laughs> what do you What do you hope um, that they know, or that they do, or that they think um, as a result of reading *Life of a Klansman*? Well, I have the dim hope that many, or at least some, will experience a sense of recognition of. Um, looking in the looking glass and seeing the outline of us. I use the word tribe in this book a lot. Um, I came to the conclusion that whiteness is a thing. It is an entity that creates a tribe out of us 260 million white Americans, so very different in so many ways. It creates a kind of unity in this radical diversity. And my dim hope is that uh, some might see as I came to see the building or creation of this tribal self. And, uh, you know, white supremacy um, had to be uh, coined and created. And I think that happened after the Civil War and not before, not during the slave period, but after the Civil War, when whiteness was confronted um, for the first time by the challenge of African Americans um, exercising power, of African Americans um, finding political power, entering the social in, in uh, large numbers, and this challenge to whiteness provoked the, um, the creation of a constellation of thought about white racial identity uh, that had not previously existed. And this constellation was, was honed and perfected and made into an idea that was ultimately nationalized and shared throughout the country. 
So the tribal aspect is one thing. And the second thing I would hope people to take away is, uh, is the ability to see this formation, this kind of white racial identity as it was assembled um, in this uh, period of, of American history. I mean, it's interesting that you say that because we know, I mean, there's, you know, that there's a racialized order, but you are accounting for, I mean, some might say like a belated narration of the emergence of whiteness, but, um, but I do think I understand what you mean because, you know, Du Bois and Black Reconstruction, when he talks about that kind of transformation of identity, he says what the end of slavery meant was that every white person assumed and internalized the power of the police, right? So that we have this like property order and there's all of these differentiations between, you know, whites who are slave owners, the mi minority versus, you know, white farmers, but part of the kind of the, the counter revolution or the Southern redemption that constant you know, makes happen is, you know, everyone gets their kind of symbolic endowment of whiteness. Um, yes. And so I don't know if you want to say more about that symbolic um, endowment. I mean, the book, you know, is clear about the, the violence <laughs> um, that's necessary to produce that endowment. But what about the cost of that endowment for for white folks, or is there a cost? I mean, I think another interesting example of your in your book is the the descendants of the free uh, man of color, the publisher Louis Rudinet. What is his name? Louis Rudinet. Yes. Yes. Um, and there's an interesting moment with his descendant where he's like talking about again racism and whiteness, and initially he says, "Well, you know, well, you know, racism." It doesn't kind of hurt me, but then he has to account for his position in a racist order. So I, I guess just to kind of think about the cost of that symbolic um, endowment of whiteness, um, do most mm -hmm. whites think that there is a cost or that there's only the privilege of it? Benefit. And how right. might, yeah. 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 Well, W. E. B. Du Bois talks about the wage of whiteness and there is a material benefit of whiteness and yet any any person of sensitivity examining the subject can also see the mutilation and truncation of white racial identity the um, which is walled in with fear and with um, emotions of of um, re repulsion and exclusion, um, this is part of part of the embedded uh, fact of being raised white uh, in this society. And I believe this goes back to the period that I write about in this book is to be raised into a kind of um, a sequ sequestered space, which is ringed by um, psychological fences and uh, antagonisms towards others. Uh, that's, that's the psychological cost of, of whiteness. I remember as a child being raised in the deep South um, and although I lived as a child for, you know, 20 years in societies that were uh, about a third to 40% African American, um, the uh, radical separation line between um, black people and white people in my experience, and I believe this was not uncommon and perhaps is not yet uncommon was uh, was pronounced and our visits as when i was a child my father was an episcopal priest 
he would from time to time, and of course his church was was white only. From time to time, we he would take us as a family to um, black churches, and it was almost as though we were going on a kind of research mission to experience the lives of of others. So yes, the the uh, the cost of whiteness is is uh, is quite is quite high. I think the last question that I want to ask before we take um, questions from the audience. Earlier, you were talking about the the resonance of this period of like the 1860s and the 1870s, which is at the heart of you know the book the revolution of you know, abolition of reconstruction and then the counter revolution. Um, what are the lessons uh, of that moment for us now as we're perched on what seems like a, a kind of abyss? Um, what, what is it we should think about when considering that moment? How might that moment actually inform our actions? So uh, a question from the audience. Um, my family was interviewed in Harlem by Ed for his Slaves in the Families book. Um, anyway, my question is, is there a Northern US equivalent of the Klan? And if so, how different or the same is it? If Ed asks, this is from Vincent James. Oh, Vincent James, yes, how do you do? Nice to hear you. Um, they, the first generation of the Ku Klux was principally in the post-Civil War South and it erupts in 1866 and goes out of business after what white Southerners called the redemption, which was the restoration of white supremacy to the political uh, life of the southern states, and that ha happens in 1877. The rest of the country doesn't have those kinds of militias until 50 years later in the 19 teens when a revived Ku Klux Klan spreads throughout the United States and recruits millions upon millions of, of members, upwards of 5 million in all the states. Uh, they are not as um, interested in targeted racial violence of the kind that um, the Southern Klan perpetrated, although there is quite a lot of um, corollary uh, activity at the time um, in the campaigns, the lynching campaigns. But without going on too much about it, um, I, my, I have a, a, a theory that the South um, is in many ways a teacher for the rest of the country, by which I mean the South creates this thing of white supremacist ideology and then exports it. Similarly, the South creates this thing of campaigns of violence against black communities and then exports it. And they are taken up by the rest of the country in the subsequent decades um, as African-Americans find their way out of the prison house of, of the Southern states. Um, and there's another question. So how have your family members responded to your research and responded to this book in particular? Yeah. My family in New Orleans, and I have quite a lot of them, um, were not particularly excited to have the story of our Klansmen made uh, public, um, but no one tried to stop me from, from telling it, from writing it. Um, I think <clears throat> a common feeling in our group is, oh, he was a bad apple. He was the bad seed uh, and we're not like him and only a couple of us were ever like him. 
And, and I believe that this is, a, it's a familiar reaction of, of distancing oneself and one's people from the worst and the most uncomfortable subjects. Um, but, you know, I, I discovered an unusual fact, which is that it appears that approximately one half of white Americans uh, have a Klansman in their family tree somewhere. And it, I, I say this, I, I demonstrate it with the following demographic projection. The, the Klan of the 1920s recruited some 5 million members they claimed 5 million members. If you, if you suppose that there were actually just 4 million, and the descendants of 4 million white Klansmen from 1925, 100 years later, by simple demographic projection, amounts to about 135 million people, which is one half of the white population of the United States. Now, not, not many, um, living Americans know that this is the case, but if they would like to know, it's, it can be found out. And it's, it's not a freakish, uh, freakish thing to have a, a Klansman in the family. Another question is, what do you want black people generationally familiar with the Klan, even those of us raised in the North, to take away from your book? Um, I would like to ask the permission of black people to unpack um, stories with which many African Americans are familiar in family lore and or by study to unpack these difficult narratives in public for the um, benefit or education or um, new knowledge of white Americans. Um, that is an indulgence that African Americans can understandably not be enthusiastic about extending um, because to hear stories of, of white supremacist violence is is not it's not comfortable it's it's demoralizing and I understand and accept that so I I ask I ask um, permission, if you like, um, for this symbolic act of revelation, for the symbolic act of revelation to, for the benefit of the wider um, social group. You know, I mean, I, I think that when I was reading, I was thinking about that in terms of anti-racist work. Yeah. You're involved in this labor that white people should be involved in, which is actually um, owning and acknowledging these histories of violence and brutality. But it seems that, but that's not then the work of black people to like witness or to bear. Um, and it is injurious because we're still in a structure of white supremacy. So, um, so I think it's. Um, it made me think about maybe s distinctions between forms of practice that are against racism and about the questions of um, alliance, you know. So, uh -huh. so that's a point that's appreciated. Uh, one question, please discuss how white women in your family enable the Klansmen. And a related question was, did you find that poor whites had the same sort of racism as slave owning or more affluent and wealthy whites. So women in the Klan and the difference between uh, the working class and the affluent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, 
It appears that um, many w women um, were not in the organizations, uh, either in the inception of the Ku Klux during Reconstruction or in its regeneration during the 19 teens and 20s, but uh, played many different roles of, of tacit support. So, uh, so for example, in working class Creole communities that I write about in Life of a Klansman, the women were at home making the disguises, making the, um, the costumes, the hoods and the, uh, and the, the disguises. Um, and I found no evidence of a, a, how can we say, a resistance movement uh, with, that was voiced by um, white women of conscience from that time. Um, the Klan then, 150 years ago, and the Klan 100 years ago during the teens and 20s, and the Klan 50 years ago during the civil rights movement always is driven by working class um, in the rank and file and elite class of propertied whites in positions of leadership. And that's what, uh, what I found in writing this story, Life of a Klansman. Um, the figures at the head of this group I mentioned earlier, Knights of the White Camellia, were propertied whites, whites of, uh, of, of means. It was a rich man's campaign and a poor man's fight. And I guess the last question is, um, this is a unique narrative, a national history, a family history, a personal reckoning with white supremacy. Um, can you let us know, were there any books or writers you look to as models for inspiration? Hmm. Yes. Um, I'm talking to one of them right now, and that, that's you, Saidiya, as a, as a comrade who, uh, who helped to show the way to tell stories about people in the shadows for whom the archive has not been generous. And, uh, and the, um, the way of imaginative reconstruction as a path into historical memory and, and the way of um, using indirect narration as a way of, of summoning the states of mind of people who are long gone and who never themselves put their, their thoughts to paper. Um, so yes, I, I can think of uh, one, and that's uh, Saidia Hartman. So um, on that note, I want to say, um, you know, thank you for a wonderful conversation, despite our technical difficulties. And I would remind our viewers that um, you can purchase Life of a Klansman in the uh, library bookshop. So please do so. It has been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure for me. Thank you, Saidia. And thanks to the New York Public Library.